It is encouraging to see such a turnout tonight. Thank you all for coming. Because of some confusion, I guess, or at least replanning as to where the location is, I don't want to start for about five minutes at least, in case people went to Southwest or Seminary and are getting diverted. So we're going to sing a little while. And uh, we will start with 218. The title is A Suppliant Church. The song speaks of the church in the figure of a vine. Israel is a vine brought out from Egypt, taken care of by God, but plucked down, destroyed almost by uh, nations around, and then a prayer to God that he will sustain the church and that we be faithful to his cause. Let's sing stanzas one, three, five, and six.
and 134. Here the church is spoken of in the figure of Zion and a mountain, Mount Zion's walls, behold, about her ramparts go and number ye the lofty towers that guard her from the foe. But it isn't ultimately the towers in themselves, it's God as our own God who defends us. All three of 134. from which I'll read in a few moments also. I will sing number 215. Based on Psalm 78, speaking of the deeds of God that are to be passed down from generation to generation. Let's sing 1 and 3 through 5. 1 and 3 through 5.
Thanks, Trees. I'll read the first few verses of Psalm 78. One through eight, 78 verses one through eight. Give ear, O my people, to my law. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old which we have heard and known and our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from their children, showing to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wonderful works that he hath done. For he established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers that they should make them known to their children, that the generation to come might know them, even the children which should be born, who should arise and declare them to their children, that they might set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments, and might not be as their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation that set not their heart aright, and whose spirit was not steadfast with God. Notice that while the psalmist speaks of telling God's law, It isn't just the law, it isn't just doctrine, it's the works that God hath done. Church history included in which is the giving of the law. And one of the benefits of the knowledge of church history is both that we know the works of God in the past, and then verse 7, that we set our hope in God in the present times and troubles that the church undergoes. Let's come to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, for life and health, we give thee thanks, and for thy care of us as individuals, as families, and as a denomination. As a denomination, we are many years old, nearing the century mark, and thou hast tried and tested us over and over. Even now we are tried and tested as silver by fire. And our prayer is that as we recount the history of thy dealings with us, that we might remember that testing and trials are for the good of thy saints, and then they are for the good of thy church as a body. We desire to praise thee, to recall the wonderful works thou hast done for us. We don't boast because of the place we have in thy church and kingdom. We don't put our trust in men and we don't praise men even though we will recall some men, several men, through whom thou didst work mightily with a view to the defense and preservation of the doctrines of sovereign grace. But our praise is in thee and to thee we give thanks. We pray thy blessing on us this evening as we turn to the task at hand and presently that thou give us safe travel home again. Forgive graciously our sins. Bless our denomination and churches in every way. Our office bearers, particularly in the work they do. And hear our prayer for Jesus' sake. Amen. You all picked up a handout, I trust, on the back table, uh, chair, and if anyone needs, I think there were enough, does anybody need a handout yet? Okay, a couple of things a moment before I proceed, let's look at the handout and just uh, make a couple uh, points off it. The first box on page one is an overview of what each of the six classes that I'll be teaching the Lord willing will cover. And the second box, an outline of where we'll go this evening. And then on the back side of the first sheet, a list of recommended resources. I, I tried to be uh, very concise. You didn't come here looking for a hundred possible books to read. Um, and several of the books you'll notice, especially in the off are RFPA books. 
and on the Jansen case, our PR publications. But the other books, Dutch uh, Calvinism in Modern America, for instance, Brat, I'll be referring to. Uh, Scott, James Scott, our family album, I'll be referring to. Just uh, different books that will help you if you want to do more reading. In every class, I intend to give another list of recommended reading for material that we covered that evening. And then on the second and third sheets, uh, things I'll be referring to in the lecture, because I don't have a PowerPoint capability, uh, I put some points there. I hope to go in these classes until about quarter to nine, and at certain points in an evening to stop and allow myself a moment for you to ask questions. I'll probably limit a question section to maybe five minutes so that we can keep moving, but certainly I'll stick around after the uh, lessons uh, so that you can ask any questions personally. And then one last thing, as you look at the outline of tonight's uh, speech, I committed a homiletical sin, and I want to be very upfront with that so that my colleague here this evening doesn't bother to tell me tomorrow. And then here's the homiletical sin. I think it's a great outline. I think it's logically arranged. But point two, the narrower historical background, B, controversies, two, Ralph Jansen, by the time I get there, you think he's almost done, and I'm not. I've got about a third of the lecture to go yet. So that's a homiletical sin. Matthew Kerner knows not to do that in his sermon when he makes an outline. Again, thank you for coming. Tonight I'm going to set the background and we'll see how far we can get of the background. It might be we have to tie up loose ends next time. But we're going to begin in the Netherlands. You have to begin in the Netherlands when you're talking about the Dutch Reformed churches and Dutch Reformed ancestry. And here I'm going to be very brief. I want to only say those things that directly bear on the formation of the PRC and the reasons for the formation. And we have to start with the offskiting or the secession of 1834. There was in 1833 one denomination of Reformed churches in the Netherlands called the Reformed Church or the Hervormde Kerk. It was the state church. It had been significantly reorganized in 1816. So it wasn't just a continuation in every instance of what the Synod of Dort and the Reformed churches of that day were like. And in 16, eight, uh, six, sorry, 1816, uh, the ruler more aggressively put the Reformed church under the control of the government. That had been the case throughout the history of the Reformed churches in the Netherlands. But even more aggressively he did, did so, so that from a church political viewpoint, church government viewpoint, there were issues and liberalism and modernism would only increase. And so there was apostasy also growing. The 1800s in Europe, even starting in the 1700s, were a time of much apostatizing. Starts off in Germany, and in England, but it goes throughout the continent. And that's the background for the 1834 secession or offskiting in the Netherlands. Six men are instrumental in that. Some of the names are familiar to you. Hendrik de Kock, Hendrik Skolte, Anthony Brommelkamp, Albert van Rolte, Simon van Velzen, and George Meerberg. I'm not going to go over the history of the offskiting now, but just point out several uh, features of the doctrine of the offskiting group that are relevant, and they are in your handout, point one, that would be on the third page. What I have in brackets are doctrinal features of the offskiting that are important to notice if, especially, you're going to dig into the history of the offskiting more but for our purposes are less relevant. The matter of infralapsarianism and the question of whether regeneration happens immediately without means by the Holy Spirit or immediately, that is, a person must hear the word of God preached to be regenerated. 
and the off-skiting took that latter view. But that's not so much important for the evening. Three things that come out of the off-skiting. The first is that there are many people who are partaking of the Lord's Supper, or rather refraining from the Lord's Supper, because they doubt whether, in fact, they are children of God. And that has to do, too, with the circumstances, the, the historical situation. There's so many coming to the Lord's Supper who don't live a godly life, who don't confess the cardinal doctrines, so some don't come. And the question is how to view them. Are they not believers? And out of that comes the teaching of the Oscuiting men that assurance does not belong to the essence of faith. That is, you can be a true believer and not have assurance. And therefore, they encouraged these to come to the Lord's Supper even if they lacked assurance. That's one point to be remembered. Second has to do with the doctrine of the covenant. There had been much development in the doctrine of the covenant in the 1600s and 1700s in the Netherlands and in England. And so it's not a surprise that the issue comes up. And the question that comes up especially is, is the covenant of God a unilateral and an unconditional covenant? Does God make it establish and maintain it alone with his elect in Jesus Christ? Simon van Velzen, the best theologian of the uh, offskiting men, said yes, the covenant is unilateral and unconditional. Yet within the offskiting group arose the idea that the covenant is bilateral and conditional. Now that developed in especially 30 years or so, by the late 1860s, that idea is being promoted. And so the idea that in baptism, the child who is baptized is given a promise by God that the blessings of salvation will be his or hers if he or she believes. Now, that's 1953. That's De uh, Wolf. And so I'm pointing it out to show there are seeds of what the PRC will deal with that are found already in the Netherlands in the 1800s. Similarly, with regard to the well-meant offer, is the preaching of the gospel an offer of God or an invitation of God to those who hear that should they receive and, and accept the invitation, they will receive the blessings He promises. And therefore, is the preaching for everybody in some sense, head for head? And do humans have the innate ability to believe when they hear that preaching? Van Velzen says no. He's orthodox. We would appreciate the man. But within the offskiting group, especially again, not immediately at its outset, but by the 1860s, it's evident that there are men who promote the well-meant offer. So, the offskiting was reformation of the church because the state church was so deformed and, and, and promoting apostasy. It was a necessary reformation and one for which we can give thanks. But in the end, you see that the leaders of the offskiting themselves are not all agreed on doctrinal matters. Uh, Skolta and uh, Brummelkamp, for instance, and even Van Rolte, if you study their history, you see areas where they disagreed with each other. They're not agreed on doctrinal matters. There isn't much positive development of truth in the Ausgiding, and in fact, along the way, there is some more regression, as with the Wellman Offer and a bilateral covenant. Now, why do I have to bother pointing out the Ausgiding? Theologically, there are seeds that will bear fruit. In the second place, the Ausgiding does represent the conservative element of Reformed believers in the United States. Uh, I'm sorry, in the Netherlands in the 1800s. And in the third place, it's many of these people who are poor, and so they seek opportunity in the New World, who are persecuted, and so they decide also to leave for the New World so they can have religious freedom, 
who begin the Christian Reformed Church. And that leads me, secondly, to speak of the Doliance, a second group of people who separated from the state church in 1886. The word Doliance means grievance. They were aggrieved also at the modernism and the apostasy in the state church. For instance, that God is triune, some denied. That Jesus Christ died on the cross to make atonement for sin, some denied. That the Bible is the revelation of God, some denied. That God is a personal being, that He's three persons, and therefore that it's possible to have fellowship with Him, some denied. These are These aren't just Reformed distinctives. These are Christian distinctives that are being denied in the state church. And so, in that context, others see the need to leave. Now, these others are led by Abraham Kuyper. He's born and raised in this liberal, modernistic context. He is himself bought into it. And he's in his first charge as a pastor, his first and only, if I'm not mistaken, before one of his parishioners gives him a copy of a document called the Canons of Dort. He's never heard of it. He's never read it. He reads it. And this parishioner speaks more to him of the doctrines of sovereign grace, of sin, of depravity of man, of the need for the grace of God, and he comes to understand the doctrines of grace. He therefore, when he comes to see the error of his own ways and the error of the church in which he lives, is ready to lead a group out of the state church. Now, without saying much more about Abraham Kuyper, there are two points of doctrine we have to bring up. The first is that he held on the one hand to particular sovereign grace, so that the RFPA has republished some years back a book of Abraham Kuyper entitled Particular Grace. That's Kuyper at his best. And at the same time, he held to common grace, as probably you have heard. And in three volumes, long volumes, set forth his view of common grace. So he holds to both. And according to this common grace, Kuyper said, God restrains man from being as evil as he could be. When we get to 1924, you will see the offskiting, well meant offer point of common grace and the Kuyperian restraint of sin common grace coming together. They have not come together in 1886. But Kuyper is teaching a restraint of sin. He does not deny the doctrine of total depravity as a doctrine. He says, however, that God's common grace holds humanity back from being as evil as it could be. Therefore, the believer and the unbeliever can work together for common causes and a common good. That's the first thing doctrinally. In the second place, He applied that view of particular and common grace to his view of the kingdom of Christ and the kingdoms of men. So the kingdom of Christ develops according to the principle of sovereign grace. The church does. But the kingdoms of men develop according to the principle of common grace. And once again, what that means is that whereas the church is being sanctified, preserved, and prepared for glory, the kingdoms of men are kept from being as evil as they could possibly be. They have the potential to be very evil, but God checks or restrains it. And therefore, also the kingdoms of men are developing in a positive direction. And once again, those who are members of the kingdom of Christ, the church, can work together with those who are involved in the kingdoms of men, I mean earthly politicians, for the good of the whole. And why did Kuiper do that? At least one motivating factor. He was both a minister in the church as well as a politician. 
Now, what you have is two groups of people who separated from the state church in the Netherlands. They both number a little under 200,000. So, six years after the Doleance, in 1892, they come together and merge, and you have a group of 350,000 plus who have separated from the state church. This is then a significant element. They're both opposed to the liberalism of the state church, but they are different from each other. And when they join and unite in 1892, they will do so in such a way that though they're living together in one denomination, there are two very distinct mentalities. Point two on the handout. The differences between the Afskiting and the Doleance when they merged in 1892. Was the state reformed church completely false or not? I think I asked each question in such a way that the first part of it is answered by the Afskiting and the second part is the answer of the Doleance. Was the state reformed church completely false or not? The Afskiting people said yes. The Doleance people said no. Some of it is. It's apostatizing, but not completely false. The order of God's decrees. Again, we won't spend time on that. The Afskiting said the infralapsarianism, that is, God decreed the creation of the world, then he decreed that man would fall into sin, then he decreed to send Christ. The decrees went in the order in which the events happened in time. And the Doliance said the opposite, supralapsarian. The decrees are in the reverse order of how things unfold in history because God wasn't just planning history chronologically. He was saying, what's the big goal? What's the end goal? And then how do I get there? So they differed there. Justification by faith alone. They agreed, both did, that there is justification only by faith, by faith alone. But is it in time or in eternity? Offsguiding the former, Doleance the latter. Regeneration, immediate through the means of the preaching, immediate by the work of the Spirit. But again, I put those in brackets because for the purposes of tonight, it's the next two that really matter. On what basis are infants to be baptized? The covenant promise of God, say the offsguiding men, even though some of them have a bilateral view of that covenant, or presupposed regeneration. And that's the answer of Abraham Kuyper and the Doliance men. And what is meant by common grace? That is, is it just that God in the preaching of the gospel tells all he would have them saved? Or is it also that there is some restraint of sin in society? Two different mentalities, two different histories, really. You put them together, it does not work well. And in 1905, a synod is held, the Synod of Utrecht, that addresses these matters. It tries to bring uh, the two groups together in their mentality more. It doesn't really work. What happens is that synod, by and large, takes the Oscuiting view of matters. And because it does so, so almost down the line, there's another group saying we were, that was to help us think alike. It, it sided with them, not us. So you have the mentality yet. And in 1944, 1944, when there was another split, now out of this Gereformerde Kerken of the Netherlands, the GKN, this group that started in, in 1892, when there's a split led by a man named Klaas Skilder, here you have the issues that were involved in the split. All right, I've given a background of what's going on in the Netherlands. In the United States, the RCA has been established long before the Afskiting, long before the reorganization of the state church. It was established when European settlers came to the colonies 
and was under the oversight of Classis Amsterdam of the Netherlands Reformed Churches. And therefore, it was really a branch of the churches in the Netherlands until the Revolutionary War was finished and it became independent. So by time settlers are going to come, immigrants from the Netherlands to the United States, because they're poor and because they're persecuted after the offsiding, the RCA is a long ways down the road from what the Reformed churches in the Netherlands, especially the conservative ones, are. The RCA has become very Americanized, for one thing, by now. In the second place, there's liberalism in the RCA also. It hasn't come primarily, it, it may have to some degree, come from Europe and the liberalism in Europe, but it came even more from what's going on in New England, in a, something I won't get into tonight, the New England theology. And the theologians of the Congregational and Presbyterian churches in New England are promoting ideas that are not solidly Reformed and Biblical, and that's influencing the RCA. So when the Dutch Reformed immigrants come, the Scultes, he didn't join the RCA even, he remained independent. But really the RCA would be the only body he could join if he wanted to. And the Van Roltes, settling the Holland, the, the shores of Black Lake, there really was only one church they could join unless they were going to just be an independent group, and that was the RCA. They did, and yet tension arose because the RCA and the Dutch immigrants are of a very different character. Culturally, they're of a different character. Culturally, of course, some are Dutch, some are English, or American, rather. Doctrinally, the RCA has, especially in New England, in the eastern seaboard, some of the liberal ideas that the Afskiding people left the state church to get away from. The virgin birth of Jesus Christ is denied, for instance. The RCA never had used the rejection of errors part of the Canons of Dort. But if you're a sound, reformed person who loved the doctrines of sovereign grace as the reformed churches developed them, the rejection of errors is a significant part of your creed. There's lax discipline in the RCA. Those who deny the virgin birth are not disciplined. There was an elder in, this is just one anecdotal illustration, an elder in one of the churches in the East who let one daughter go to the Methodist church and let another daughter go to uh, the uh, Congregational Church and another to the Baptist Church. And his view was they're all Christians anyway. And therefore, what's the problem? That's the view, especially in the eastern part of the RCA. The RCA is happy to have immigrants. They call this mission work. We can grow. The RCA at the time was not much east, or rather west, of Pennsylvania, and so maybe just into Ohio. But the idea that there would be a whole group of people, part of the RCA, off way to the west in Michigan, that's how Western Seminary gets its name, in, uh, in Holland, the seminary of the RCA, not because it's in Western Michigan, because it was in the western part of civilization as far as the RCA was concerned when it was established in the 1800s. So the RCA wants this. There really isn't an option for the immigrants to do if they're going to join a church, but troubles arise, and that leads in 1857 to the formation of the Christian Reformed Church. That history I won't get into at length either. You can read it in uh, some of the books I've mentioned there, and some of them, by the way, are short books. They're, they're not, for the most part, long ones. Henry Beats, uh, D.H. Krummingas, uh, and even James Scott. It's larger, but it's uh, maybe a little less substantive, and it's a little broader. It, it goes through another 50 or more years of history, so there would be less of it that was really relevant for this. 
The CRC begins in Holland, Michigan, in, 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 in Crosscott, Michigan, in 1857. What happens after the CRC begins is that it is the most conservative reform group in the United States. You would say again, and we would, without hesitation, that 1857 was Church Reformation. Church Reformation, remember, is a return to reform doctrine, a reform system of church government, a reformed system of worship and liturgy. Those three things especially make up church reformation. When one recognizes error and works to correct it and if need be, reforms as an institute, reformation has happened. So we're not ashamed to say of 1857 that it was church reformation. And that if you or I were alive in the 1850s, 60s, 70s in West Michigan, that we ought to consider the CRC to be the church in which, uh, to which we should belong. It grows quickly. Immigrants are coming in droves. And many of them don't want to settle where there are English-speaking people. They're happy to settle where there are Dutch-speaking people, or at least form connections with Dutch-speaking people. And the members of the CRC have only arrived in the last decades. Besides, there are churches in the RCA that separate from the RCA to become a part of the CRC, recognizing that the CRC is more conservative. It grows quickly. For most of the 1800s, the process of Americanization does not get started and take place in the CRC. They're very Dutchy and happy to stay Dutch in their culture and their language. And Abraham Kuyper has not raised his questions and issues off in the Netherlands yet. And so the CRC, almost through the 1800s, for sure through the 1880s, is a conservative body, but the dynamics are such that there will be another clash at attention, and that will lead to the formation of the PRC. All right, what I've done is finished Roman numeral one, and I'll give you five minutes or so for questions so far. All right, and you can talk to me later, and my email address is publicly known, I think, too. So we're going to get then to, yes, Peter, you wait until I'm, say, time's up. Go ahead. Um, did uh, the, these Hollanders, either in the Netherlands or in this country, ever land on a question, an answer to the question of whether the, the old Hedderford Bouquet state church in the Netherlands was um, fully a false church or an apostate church. Again, the, the Oscotting group said it was false. The Doliance generally took the view apostatizing, not completely false. And the CRC is begun with Oscotting men because there wasn't anything other than Oscotting men. So, although I can't point you to uh, concrete evidence, I'm going with the general understanding that it was a false church. Was there any evidence of the way that they spoke about the Reformed Church in America once they had formed into the Christian Reformed Church? Um, let me be clear on the question. Evidence that they viewed the RCA as a false church? Yeah, how did they talk about the RCA once they had formed into the uh, Christian? You have to, 
understand um, that what one man says, you have to ask, is he speaking for all or just for himself? The, the men who originate the CRC are, the Lord used them in a good way, and they were colorful personalities who said some things that we maybe wouldn't all cheer about. Nonetheless, they viewed the RCA, I don't know if I can quote them as saying false, but going in the direction. And there were serious problems in the RCA. I talked about the denial of the virgin birth, um, open communion, um, lodge membership was permitted. That was a big issue that was a factor in the formation of the CRC. And, and remember, well, remember, uh, some of the CRC originators thought Van Rolte duped them a bit when he encouraged them to join the RCA. He knew, they spoke Dutch. The RCA speaks English. Van Rolte, through a translator, can converse with them. But he's their man. Uh, that is, the immigrants know nothing except what Van Rolte tells them. And Van Rolte gives a good report of uh, the RCA and when some men, I think it took an elder going to the east for a meeting of the synod or something, uh, and saw some of what was going on, he definitely took the idea that Van Rolte had duped them. He, he'd pulled one over on them, not given them the full picture. I can't point you to somewhere that says they viewed the RCA as false, certainly though apostatizing. Mary Beth. Was the kind of music that was sung in the Reformed Church any reason for the Christian Reformed Church to reject the company? Him singing. Yep. And they weren't by then just, shall you call them, the good hymns either, necessarily. In, in the East, the, remember the RCA today too allows a lot of latitude in its member churches to do what they want. And so we have to view the denomination at that time that way too, I think. There was a spectrum. But part of the spectrum was that hymn singing is permitted and the offskiting people would not have that. Yeah. It's, I think it's going to be a factor in the Skilder matter, but in the PRC history, no, I won't be returning to that so much. Follow up, though? Not right now. Okay. Yeah. I've been fascinated with the whole infra supra development and how that, that you refer to that here. Once the outside of the Alliance came to America, did that kind of fade in the background because they were dealing with all kinds of cultural things, or did the CRC, compared to the RCA, take a different perspective, and did that develop further in 24? I think the latter. Um, in 1905, the Senate of Utrecht that tried to bring these two groups together and pretty well took the offskiting side. The results of that get published. The, the, the people in the CRC are very curious yet what's going on in the Netherlands. And that gets talked about in the CRC. And I think by then there's a growing divide in a number of these issues, including that, which leads a Hoeksema to address the matter and weigh in on the matter. If not at the time, he certainly has as a, uh, by time he's a mature theologian in the PRC, and to take a modified supra view. So it's a factor, it, but I don't think it alone, there are bigger factors yet. That's why I put these in brackets. So anyone further? All right, good questions, thank you. The CRC has some issues in the 1900s. Maybe you could start with 1890, but for sure by the 1900s it is prominent. There is Americanization. Inevitably it happens. The longer you live in a country, 
different from your homeland, where the people speak a different language than your homeland, the more you're going to say, we need to start learning about our neighbors, being a little more like them. And Americanization does not inherently mean you're becoming liberal. Um, Dutchmen didn't always understand that, but it doesn't inherently mean that. It just means you're learning a different language. You're beginning to interact with society around you. That is happening. However, a part of Americanization is also that people ask, all right, we speak the same language as our neighbors. We're interacting with them more. This is what they do at church. They have choirs. They sing hymns. Why don't we? So Americanization is not inherently, but it does lead to the matter of uh, a departure from the strict Reformed view on worship especially. So choirs in worship come into place. Hymn singing. A new order of worship is developed. Sunday school is, starts to get more uh, prominence and emphasis than catechism. And an issue which led to the formation of the CRC in 1857, labor unions that a stand against, sorry, lodge membership, a stand against lodge membership now resurfaces in a different form slightly, and that is Labor unions, may we join labor unions. In the 1900s, uh, the industrial age, etc., it was a big question. So, that's going on. There are changes in the CRC. Secondly, the doctrinal winds of Europe are blowing westward. I have three ways in which that's happening. The first is that Kuiper has now come on the scene, 1886. Uh, 1892 is the union of the two groups. And so the CRC is aware of this new leader in uh, Netherlands and his new ideas. He writes in Dutch. The CRC readers can easily read what he's written. And the question then becomes, what about his view of common grace? What about his view of the restraint of sin? Of, and not a denial of total depravity as a doctrine, but a, an idea that God restrains it in practice. So, some men are against it, and some men are saying, but he's reformed. He's in our, basically, mother church, and so they're considering it. The doctrinal winds of Kyperianism are coming across. Second, something I don't have time to get to at length, there have been schools, we'll call them seminaries, because that's really what they are. When I say school, it's a, a place for teaching men, but they're also schools of thought. And if you, would, if you knew um, in more detail the history of Europe in the 18 in early 1900s, and the different approaches to scripture that were being promoted, then you would say, oh, that's that school. Oh, that one's that school. And there's a school in Groningen called the Groninger School in the Netherlands, as well as different schools in Germany that are teaching wrong ideas, higher critical ideas, Ideas that the Bible really is not word for word inspired and inerrant the word of God, but that it's the word of man. Now we're going to come back to this when we get to Rolf Jansen because he's buying into these ideas. In fact, in your handout, I don't know, I only took three pages. It's the third and fourth sheets. Yep, page 151. Uh, let, let me say that those two sheets are, are copied from something I have in your bibliography, the reports and decisions in the case of Dr. R. Jansen, published by the Senate of Orange City. And 
the, they're really the reports of the study committee to investigate Janssen. But if you look on page 151, and my point now is just to glance down, you see about a halfway, just a little over halfway, uh, he accepts the documentary hypothesis. And though he does not agree with certain critics and generally criticizes the Wellhausen school, so there you have a certain school, a certain view of, um, uh, of the Bible. And then a little later, three lines later, he has a marked similarity between his conceptions and those of the ethical school. And I'm only pointing out, those are two of several schools that are coming up with different views of Scripture. And so that, secondly, and in, the, in America, many denominations, the Congregationalists, which began very Calvinistically in the 1600s, the Baptists, the Presbyterians, the Methodists, all of which have in them a conservative element and a growing liberal element, they also are talking about these ideas that are coming over uh, from uh, Europe and discussing them. So higher critical views of Scripture, which in some means, Scripture is not word for word, infallibly, inerrantly, the inspired Word of God. And in the third place, doctrinal winds include uh, the Synod of Utrecht and its decisions, trying to reconcile the two groups in the Netherlands, and especially this question for the moment, how do we view baptized children? In what sense are they in the covenant? Is it because of the promise of God to believers to save believers and their children? Is it because we presuppose that they are regenerated? Afskiding or Doleance? Kuiper. That question is coming up and it's getting discussed and within the CRC, men are taking different views. And the question, we should baptize children of confessing members, but should we baptize children of baptized members? Is it okay if a parent has not made confession of faith that we baptize the child yet? So that's getting discussed. Doctrinal winds from Europe. And in the third place, there are divisions of thought in the CRC. And here you go to point three on the third page. Uh, divisions in the CRC in the early 1900s. What I did is copy page 47 of James Bratt's book, Dutch Calvinism, and a chart that he has there entitled The Four Mentalities of the Dutch American Community. Now for our purposes, four will become three. And the reason four will become three is because the top left-hand one, called outgoing optimistic seceders, uh, is found in the RCA. Brat here is looking at four different magazines, four different publications of the RCA and the CRC, and he's finding four different mentalities. So skip the, the very first one you'd come to, uh, because that's the RCA, and that leaves you with three in the CRC. And he finds three mentalities in the CRC. One is uh, conservative. He calls it defensive and introverted. Uh, but it's those who are saying, let's be confessional, let's be faithful to the confessions. And he lists Fapa Ten Hoor and L.J. Holst as representatives. Really, those are men saying, the offskiting, we need to hold to the tradition of the offskiting. Across the page, uh, I mean across the, the column, uh, at the bottom, the antithetical Calvinists. These are those who are ready to listen to, to Kuiper a bit more and give him a little more, but they're willing also to be antithetical. In other words, Kuiper's going too far. So they'll take some of Kuiper, but not all of him. And they're represented by Klaus Schooland and Jan, uh, John van Lunkhuizen. And then right above them, the positive Calvinists, really men who are saying Kuiper is the man, 
and that includes B.K. Kuiper, Johannes Grohn, he will factor in uh, 1924, Henry Beats. The point is there are three main mentalities. Now, James Brad is a CRC historian. When you read him, you assume he knows what he's talking about, but I'm going to give a digression a moment on studying history. Historians tell you facts, and if they get their facts wrong, that's a, that's a shame on them. We ought to have our facts right. But secondly, historians relate facts. They take two facts and they say how they stand in, in relationship to each other. And the reader always has to say, did he do it right? And thirdly, historians interpret facts and their relationships, and even more, the reader has to say, did he do it right? This is the hard part of studying history. You read a book, say, I learned a lot of facts. Good. Did you get a line fed you that you don't recognize, that you bought into? as regards the interpretation of the facts or the relationship of the facts. So as I read Brad, this, this uh, system that he's developed is influential. Many people allude to this and say, yup, that's how it was. And I say, I don't know it wasn't, but I want more proof. I want more evidence that he's drawn the relationships accurately. And that's why I was delighted uh, earlier this year when I was preparing this for the seminary course, it took a, come across and, and listen to again the speeches that were given in Kalamazoo PRC in 1982. Reverend Cornelius Hankel, uh, Prof. Hooksema, Prof. Hankel, Prof. Decker all talked about the history of the PRCA in the first 50 years. And listening to Reverend Hanko's speech on the origin of the PRCA, I have the quote, and I was delighted to hear what he said. So I'm quoting almost word for word. I'm transcribing. I may have got some words wrong. At the time when this controversy, he means common grace, started, before the early 1920s already, there were two groups, definite groups, in the Christian Reformed Church. And then that two is going to get subdivided, so there's three. On the one hand, there was a strong conservative element. And by conservative, I mean people who wanted to be reformed, although that again has to be limited somewhat. A strong conservative group numerically. On the other hand, there was a growing liberal group that wanted really to go along with the world as much as possible in every way. That liberal group, uh, well, let me finish the quote, and then I can show how this relates to, uh, to Brad. This conservative group was really, again, divided into two different sections. There were those that were staunchly reformed, Pros, Volbida, and Tedhor. There were also, though, even among conservatives, those that were more or less inclined towards free will, towards the offer of salvation, and so on. That offer of salvation was in the church a long time. It had never become an official doctrine. That God offered salvation was taught by some who were of the conservative element, although, of course, the weakest part. Then you had, on the other hand, what you could rather brand as liberal, represented by Prof. Meter from Kelvin and by Prof. Jansen in particular. More and more they wanted to join, as they said at that time, Jerusalem and Athens, the church and the world. They wanted no part of the antithesis. They went along with all the modern ideas of science and philosophy and were very strong in philosophy and science as the products of God's common grace. All right, Brat has three groups. Hankel found three groups. Are they lining up the same? Two of them are. The conservative group that was staunchly reformed is the same, basically, as Brat's confessionalists. And then the liberals who want Jerusalem and Athens line up essentially with Bratt's positive Calvinist, the go Kuiper, he's our man. And the only question would be whether that middle group is being explained in the same way. I'm not going to get into that right now. I was still heartened to see that one of our own men who had his upbringing in the CRC 
understood also there are three divisions in the CRC at that point. And so, to come to the conclusion of the issues in the CRC at this point, uh, Huxima himself says it this way in his book, The Protestant Reformed Churches of America, the CRC was not wholly purged from the leaven of Pelagianism and Arminianism. There is in the CRC a tolerance of the idea that God has two wills, a will to save all men, which you declare in the preaching of the gospel, and a will that only some will be saved, the will of uh, predestination and election. And there is also in the CRC a growing indifference. It's not widespread, but it is growing, and prominent men are promoting it, a growing indifference to the confessions. They claim to be Calvinists, but to be Calvinists is not so much to be faithful to the canons of Dort as it is to follow Kuiper, who says, common grace, that's Calvinism. You're getting the stage set for a controversy. I don't know if I'll even get to start Ralph Jansen, so I want to keep moving a minute at least to get through uh, the first of what I call the big three. So, there's a powder king sort of getting set up and then three controversies that are going to contribute significantly to the explosion. A couple of general comments about what I call the big three. On the one hand, they demonstrate that in the CRC there are different mindsets. But there's something else that will tie them together. D.H. Krominga, the CRC church historian, says, what ties them together is Americanization. The churches are becoming Americanized, and therefore these controversies, I say that just can't do justice to it. Maybe it's a factor, but, but it isn't the basic issue. Uh, it's just a circumstantial matter that they're becoming, um, that they're becoming Americanized, and then it would be also a little overstatement to say common grace ties them together. Common grace ties in the second and the third, the Jansen case and uh, the Hooksima case. But it doesn't so much explain the Baltima case and the matter of premillennialism. What ties them all together is modernism, or let me say, the liberal views about Scripture and how to respond to those liberal views. Harry Baltima detected modernism in the Reformed churches in the Netherlands and in the Christian Reformed church and opposed it. He did it in the wrong way. Ralph Jansen not only detected modernism, but promoted it. He got in trouble for that. Herman Hoeksema and Henry Danhoff opposed not just the expressions of modernism that Jansen had promoted and the CRC said, no, not your way, Jansen. Hoeksema and Danhoff got to the root of the matter and the CRC said, we don't want that. Modernism, how to view the scriptures. That's the common thread. Let's get the first one out of the way, and I could do that rather briefly. Uh, premillennialism is making inroads in the early 1900s into the American church scene. It didn't begin, premillennialism had existed, but it's developed significantly in the early 1900s. Even, by the way, Skolta himself had some premillennial ideas and could promote them without any fear because he remained independent. He was the leader of his own group. But on the other hand, the Reformed churches were confessionally amillennial. Not, we're looking for things to happen and then Christ will suddenly come and then, but all of New Testament history 
is working toward the coming of the kingdom of Christ and Christ's coming and his kingdom will bring us into heaven. But although the Reformed creeds do not allow premillennialism in any sense, and although I and you would argue they also don't permit postmillennialism in any sense, yet you did find in the Reformed churches and in the CRC post-millennial ideas. And really that's what common grace was promoting, especially the Kuyperian view. The kingdoms of men can get better. That's, that's an inherent idea of post-millennialism. History is getting better and better. Pretty soon we'll have the golden age here on earth. But what helped premillennialism was World War I. And anyone who had this idea of common grace and the kingdoms of men getting better and better suddenly said, what is, how do you explain this world war that's devastating Europe and uh, parts of Russia and, that, and, and involving the U.S. too? The world isn't getting better and better. And it's in that context that Baltimore promotes his views on premillennialism. He has both an um, autobiography, which we have in the seminary library, very interesting autobiography, in which he begins several pages with my theology and my tenets. He gets right at the matter of what he believes. And in that, he makes clear that he is pre-millennial. But he also, in 1917, published a book called Maranatha, a study of unfulfilled prophecies. He goes to the Bible, finds prophecies that haven't been fulfilled yet in his mind, and gives his view of how they will be fulfilled, and does so in a pre-millennial way. Which is to say, he looks for some literal, full, earthly fulfillment of a prophecy, instead of a spiritual fulfillment. And he looks for that fulfillment in an earthly Israel. And so he distinguishes an earthly Israel from the church of Christ. And Jesus Christ is the king of Israel, and he is the head of the church, but they are two different entities, and Christ has two distinct functions. This is Baltimore's view. He expects Israel to be restored as a nation. And in 1918, there are four overtures that come to Synod to condemn his teachings. Um, and the consequence is his teachings are condemned, but he's not deposed. The Synod of the CRC says to, uh, assigns a committee to go visit the consistory, this would be First Muskegon CRC, of which he's the pastor, and try to convince the consistory to convince Baltimore to retract his views. But he does not, and his consistory will not desire that and ask that of him. And so the classist Muskegon deposes him in December of 1918. CRC rejects premillennialism. That won't be the answer. But Baltimore was trying to respond to a liberal view of the Bible. He did it in the wrong way, not just because premillennialism is a wrong doctrine, but because part of the way he did it and part of what makes premillennialism tick is to say the Bible will be literally fulfilled. Always go to the Old Testament, find a prophecy, and look for an earthly fulfillment. He is responding to modernism. All right, I best stop uh, because, as I said, I'm not near finished even though I'm on the last point. We'll have a few uh, comments, questions, and then I pick up here next week. Any questions so far? Yep. you know what Psalter the CRC used? I am quite sure of that, short of, short of saying, 100% sure I'll say 95. 
they, they use the songbook from the Netherlands. not in the CRC. Now, did the RCA have psalms in their songbook? I suspect yes. And did the CRC look to them? I do not know. Anyone further? Okay, again, thank you for your uh, good turnout tonight. We'll be at Southwest, and in the fellowship hall, probably because there I have PowerPoint available to me and uh, a projector and a screen. So that's where we'll meet the rest of the time. There's a wedding there Friday and it uh, was not available tonight. Let us close in prayer. Heavenly Father, the church of which we're part is a small part of a 2,000 year a body that's existed for 2,000 years since Christ's death and resurrection and the outpouring of the Spirit and really even traces itself back into the Old Testament Israel and all the way to Adam. And when we recognize that, we understand that we have a long history we're thankful for preserving us, not just over a hundred years, but preserving thy church for 6,000. We see not only in the past 100, but even over the period of 6,000 years, in how many ways Satan has attacked and tried to destroy it. And thy faithfulness is manifest in preserving thy church and time and again reforming her so that we saw evidences of the reformation of the church tonight. And our prayer is one of praise to thee for reforming her and a petition that thou wilt continue through us to reform the church of Christ. Thou wilt give us as a denomination and our leaders, the grace, the wisdom, the knowledge of Scripture, and all the gifts necessary to continue to bring us back to the Scriptures, to the Reformed Confessions, and to Reformed Church government and worship. And in that way, that we might show ourselves to be a continuation of Reformed Churches and know that we are not the only true churches in the world, but true churches in whom and through whom Jesus Christ lives and works. Graciously forgive our sins and sinfulness as denomination, congregations, individuals, and families. And now we've spent time together this evening we thank Thee for the opportunity. Bless us as we go our homeward way. And according to Thy will, bring us and others together again next week to the praise of the glory of Thy name and to celebrate and call to mind Thy wondrous works in our history. Hear our prayer for Jesus' sake. Amen.